Hi there and welcome back. This is Lisa Schimold, Crafton Hills College, and I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about bacterial diseases of the digestive system. I anticipate this is going to be a two-part lecture, so let's see how far we get with this first section. All right, let's begin with dental caries, and that is a term that refers to cavities. Cavities are a result of a gradual softening of the enamel of the tooth. And if this goes untreated, it can lead to, or I should say progress to, an invasion of the pulp or the nerve of the tooth and uh, an infection of the surrounding and supporting tissues like gums, ligaments, muscle, and bone, for example. Uh, cavities really weren't very common in our society until the introduction of table sugar. Uh, it's estimated that Americans eat at least 100 pounds of sugar a year each. That's a little bit scary, isn't it? What happens is, is that oral bacteria are going to convert the sugars in our mouth uh, into acids. Think of your mouth as a tube of fermentation broth. Do you recall when we inoculated fermentation broth to see if an organism could ferment glucose or sucrose or another carbohydrate? If they did, they produced acid which caused the phenyl red pH indicator in the broth to change from red to yellow. Well, essentially that's the same thing that's happening in our mouth. And it's actually the acid, the metabolic waste products of the bacterium, that break down the enamel of the tooth and erode uh, the other layers of the tooth as well. There are a number of bacteria that can cause cavities, and we refer to those bacteria as being karyogenic, that means cavity causing. Uh, but Streptococcus mutans is probably the most common culprit. It's a gram positive caucus, and what it's going to do is it establishes itself on our teeth along our gum line and then it produces a sticky substance called dextrin. Now uh, then what happens is within this uh, kind of cocoon of dextrin the bacterium begins to metabolize the sugars in our mouth producing actually very strong acids and uh, this whole kind of nasty mess, the bacterium its metabolic waste products and the dextrin, they are collectively referred to as plaque. Now, some of the bad news is, is that plaque is not soluble in saliva. So that means it's got to be mechanically removed by brushing and flossing and having your teeth cleaned at the dentist at least twice a year. Um, now, if this is allowed to continue, these strong pots, pockets of acid are gonna wear through the enamel of the tooth and then uh, into the next layer, which is called the dentin, and then finally into the nerve or the pulp of the tooth and can progress into what's known as periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is a generalized term that refers to inflammation and degeneration of the tissues that I've mentioned previously. Uh, so anyways, it would be um, good to brush and floss at least twice a day and to see your dentist uh, at least a couple of times a year. Okay, let's move into some bacterial diseases of the lower digestive system. And there's some vocabulary that's useful for this discussion. Let's talk about uh, three categories or types of bacterial infections of the digestive system. First of all are what we refer to as intoxications. Now in this situation, the, um, uh, the illness or the disease or the symptoms that you experience are going to be the result of ingestion of a preformed toxin. What I mean is, is that the bacterium contaminated the food, grew there and secreted a toxin um, into the food that when you eat it is going to cause the symptoms uh, of this is going to be a type of food poisoning. Staphylococcal food poisoning is an example of an intoxication and this is a, a really common form of food poisoning. Um, I hope you'll recall that Staph aureus is uh, part of the normal flora of our sinuses and um, if it uh, contaminates food and under the right circumstances which I'll talk about in more detail in a little bit, it can make us very ill. The second category of digestive system infections are called uh, infections, literally. Situation's a little different. In this case, you're going to ingest bacterial contaminated food. Salmonella is an example of this one. The bacterium is going to require a little bit of time to actually colonize the tissues of your GI tract and then after a longer incubation period that we see with the first category, you will begin to exhibit symptoms. The third category, they're referred to as toxical infections and they're kind of a combination of the first two examples. A disease known as cholera, 
that's acquired by ingestion typically of fecal contaminated water is an example of a toxicoinfection. So an individual uh, consumes fecal contaminated water, uh, the bacterium is going to colonize their GI tract and then while there it will produce a toxin and that's when the patient will start to exhibit symptoms. Okay, uh, let's talk next about staphylococcal food poisoning. Staphylococcal food poisoning is, as I said earlier, a very common form of food poisoning. It causes maybe 25% of food poisoning cases a year, caused by Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram-positive coccus, normal flora of our nasal caries, and for some people it may colonize their skin. That's not really considered to be um, normal flora. I jokingly refer to it as abnormal normal flora in those cases, but um, in any event, Staph aureus, from our body contaminates food. Uh, this is typically due to poor hygiene. And um, once that happens, if circumstances are favorable for Staph aureus, it will grow in the food, secrete a toxin into the food, and then when that food is ingested, uh, you're not going to be feeling very well. A very classic scenario would be Thanksgiving. So let's say we buy a 20 pound turkey and we uh, clean it up and we get it ready. Uh, to go in the oven, we put it in the oven, we bake it, we take it out, and it's um, warm and sterile. We've killed any competing microorganisms and moist and highly nutritious. And then if Staph aureus contaminates uh, that turkey, it's going to grow like wildfire, producing what's known as an enterotoxin as it grows. Now, this enterotoxin is extremely heat stable. So what that means is this. Once the food has been contaminated with this type of toxin, it really doesn't matter what you do to the food, it will never be safe to eat. With some types of food contamination, uh, thoroughly cooking the food will take care of the problem, but not here. Uh, as a matter of fact, this enterotoxin is so heat stable that if the food was boiled for 30 minutes, the, the toxin would still be stable and would still make you ill upon its ingestion. Now, one of the ways that you can determine what type of food poisoning you have is by, of course, the symptoms, but also by the incubation period. With staphylococcal food poisoning, you'll typically start to experience symptoms one to six hours after ingesting the food. So, if you eat something and a few hours later you find yourself in the bathroom, it's not a coincidence, you've been food poisoned. And by the way, there's really no such thing as the 24-hour flu, it's food poisoning. Uh, incubation, one to six hours, uh, and then the symptoms are going to include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, and typically this is a self-limiting infection. Uh, the symptoms will resolve in about 24 hours of time after they begin, and really the only treatment that's going to be helpful here would be replacement of fluids and electrolytes. Now I want to stress that we need to not just drink water. We need to have those electrolytes because uh, when we're losing a lot of water through diarrhea and vomiting, we're losing electrolytes as well. And if we only replace the water, not the electrolytes, then we're going to uh, further upset the balance of the electrolytes in our system. So fluid, electrolytes, Gatorade, uh, Pedialyte, whatever uh, you prefer to use. <laughs> 